to uh, thank the, uh, the organizers for inviting me to give this talk on vestibular vote myogenic potentials. Uh, I won't go into the details that I plan to go into with this talk to help catch up for time. Um, so I, I, don't, I predict that I won't, this won't take me uh, long to, uh, to present, but I'll be presenting the basics of the vestibular vote myogenic potentials, which will be uh, which you will see be, um, in, in practice at the workshop later on. And also, if you have questions that are related to the session, you can ask me during the um, workshop. Okay, so the, talking about the basics about vestibular vote myogenic potentials, I don't have to go into the details of the inner ear. We already know that already. And if we didn't know that before, we already know it by now with the many excellent lectures today. What I want to point out here is that vestibular vote myogenic potentials are, looked, are used to look mainly at the function of the otolith organs within the inner ear, the utricle and the sacule, that which are not covered by much of the other paramedical examinations that we have at our disposal. For the semicircular canals, we have the head impulse test, video head impulse test and caloric test. And now that we, we have at our disposal a way of recording function or determining dysfunction of the otolith organs, specifically those related to linear acceleration using the vestibular evoked myogenic potential. So if you're already familiar with evoked potentials, for example, the brainstem auditory evoked potential or the BIEP, you know that you need a specific stimulus to evoke a potential in the pathway of interest that you are interested in to average response and to get a representation of a central nervous system signal that represents the sensory system that you are interested in. So with regards to the vestibular system, the initial attempts to stimulate the vestibular system was using natural stimuli. In other words, using methods to accelerate the head, either placing the patient in a rotating chair, as you saw earlier in earlier lectures, with regards to the use of the rotating chair and allowing to, the head to drop very quickly. But as you can understand, this is not an easy stimulus to give. It requires big systems and it's also unpleasant for the patient and difficult to reproduce. But now we have at our disposal, since the 1990s, a way to easily evoke a vestibular response using sound stimulation. We can also use bone-conducted vibration, but my emphasis in this talk is with air-conducted sound, with headphones. So if you are familiar with brainstem auditory vote potentials and you have such a system in your laboratory, you can do VEMPs. It's just a question of changing the stimulus characteristics, which I will describe later on. So, so you, one can ob obtain a vestibular signal using sound stimulation, and I'll show you later as to why you can do that. And these signals are recorded instead of from the scalp, as with most evoked potentials, you record these signals from contracting muscles. Okay? And, <coughs> sorry. And like, like with most other evoked potentials, this is non invasive and all recorded from the surface. So, sound stimulation to record a vestibular signal. One can use uh, clicks if you only have clicks but you need a higher stimulus intensity than what you would no you normally use in biops. Instead of 70 decibels above average hearing threshold, you need to use at least 110 decibels. But if you have the ability to use tone stimulation, the best tone is 500 hertz, you can use 90 decibels. I mentioned the possibility of using bone conducted vibration, uh, which you can do at a later stage. Um, this can also elicit vestibular responses. Galvanic stimulation using electrical stimulation across the mastoid is also possible, but um, it's difficult to do. There are technical problems using galvanic stimulation and not many laboratories use it. So most laboratories on a global scale use either sound uh, stimulation or bone conducted vibration. And why can you use sound stimulation? Because the vestibular end organs are located behind the oval window. So normal sound does not stimulate the, the, the otolith organs. I won't go into the details because of time, but using the right stimulus or the right sound stimulation, 500 hertz at 90 decibels or clicks at 110, the sound has enough 
power to go across and stimulate the otolith organs, and you can send and evoke potential down the vestibular nerve and through the vestibular pathway. And using the vestibular evoked myogenic potentials, you can uh, record separately from the superior and the inferior vestibular nerve. So you can get additional information with, with regards to the, the, the different divisions of the vestibular nerve together with the other paramedical examinations. And what will I, I will emphasize here is to combine the VEMP results with your other paramedical examinations as a test battery and not to see your VEMPs on its own or even the calorics on their own or the video-head impulse test on its own. All these tests should be combined together to give a complete picture as to what's happening with your patients. And if you do do VEMPs in your hospital, your department, or you are starting to do VEMPs, neurologists will also be interested to do the tests with you because this, the pathway of the vestibular vote myogenic potential involves the brainstem. So if a person wants to rule out brainstem dysfunction, they can do VEMPs in, in addition to brainstem or to develop potentials. And what's important is that the upper cervical spinal cord is also involved in this pathway. And this is important for patients with MS, for example, multiple sclerosis, where it has been shown in the literature that the upper cervical spinal cord is indeed involved to a significant extent in these patients. And the VAMPs can be used to evaluate this part of the, uh, the spinal cord as well. So, uh, like I said, 500 hertz um, at uh, 90 decibels. If you only have clicks, 110 decibels, and you average about 100 to 250 stimulations. This is talking about VEMPs in general. So we have two main types of vestibular myogenic potentials that we use clinically now, that is uh, mentioned, uh, described in the literature. The first VEMP is the one that has been described, that was invented first or discovered first, the cervical vestibular myogenic, myogenic potential, which is recorded in the majority of cases from the stenocleidomastoid muscle. It's an easy muscle to record from, and I will show it in the workshop later. It's a very easy muscle to find. You record, you give sound stimulation, you ask the patient to contract the muscle at the same time, ask either by lifting the head from a supine position or turning the head to the opposite side. And this, uh, the cervical vestibular vote margin of potential is specific or mainly specific to sacular function, from the secular otolith organ, the inferior vestibular nerve, and related structures in the brainstem. Okay? And this response is an inhibitory one. The setup is very simple. It's a three electrode setup where the active electrode is placed usually on the midpoint of the stenocleidomastoid muscle or a little higher up. The reference on the clavicle and the ground either on the forehead or on the sternum Whichever place you prefer, it doesn't matter, as long as it's near the head. So like I said, you have to contract the stenocleidomastoid muscle at the same time because the cervical vamp is an inhibitory response. So you have to inhibit something, and what you inhibit is the contraction. So you ask the patient to either lift the head up, which produces better responses, or if you don't have a bed and you have the patient sitting in a chair, to turn the head to the other side, but lying down and lifting the head up gives you larger responses. So this is an example of a response from our laboratory where you have the muscle contracting and you have a, a very transient inhibition of the background contraction. And this is a, the, the cervical vestibular vermeidogen potential obtained after averaging about 100 stimulations. Um, and and the, the response occurred, uh, the, uh, you, you get a major positivity at about 30 milliseconds after stimulus onset. Um, and I will show you uh, uh, other examples of this response as well. This is a very good response, and there are, you will get other good responses. Sometimes it may be difficult to see the, con the muscle, the response on top of your contraction. So you need to do two trials or three trials of your recordings to see a reproducible response. Now, the portent, now, so this represents secular function, as I said. What's important here with regards to the cervical vestibular vote margin of potential, and which is forgotten uh, by, not only by many laboratories, but by many publications, then this is an important point, that you need to control for muscle contraction. Muscle contraction needs to be monitored in some way. In other words, you do not record the CVAMP on its own, and that's the end of the day. You need to control for muscle contraction. Why? Because the stronger the contraction of the muscle, the larger the response. 
So if you do not control your muscle for muscle contraction, your amplitudes will be all over the place and you're not, you will not be able to differentiate between normal controls and your patients. So you need to control for muscle contraction. One way to do that is something we will demonstrate in the workshop later on, where you have a, um, a, a color signal, when, and when the, with the contraction of the muscle, it goes into the blue. If there's not enough muscle contraction, it goes into the red. This controls for muscle contraction, and thereby you get a defined amplitude, a controlled amplitude response. What we do in our laboratory is record the EMG in parallel without sound uh, stimulation. So this, this represents uh, EMG of the muscle contraction. We obtain the ratio of the CVAMP to the EMG. The stronger the contraction, the higher the amplitude, but the ratio stays the same. Okay? So either by monitoring the EMG as it is with some um, um, expert software program that you may have. If you don't have such a software program, you can use the sensory nerve conduction study on your uh, system to record the muscle um, activation. I say the sensory nerve conduction study because what you are recording is in microvolts and your motor nerve conduction study will not be sensitive enough to record this. So you need uh, the sensory nerve conduction study program if you have it to record the EMG in the microvolt vein, range and measure the amplitude and compare it to your CVAP so you have a definite amplitude parameter for each patient. And why is it important to record EMG? This is an example of a patient um, that I had just about a few weeks ago where this is the CVAP response from the left ear and the right ear. You see the, the, we have the same sensitivity in each uh, square on top. This response here, the CVAP here, looks larger than on the right. So you, you apparently see a, have a large amplitude on the left compared to the right, but this is not true. When, when recording the amplitude on each side, the EMG on the left is larger than the EMG on the right. And when you calculate the amplitude ratio between your CVEP and your EMG, the amplitude ratios are similar. 1.68 to 1.57. So this is in fact a normal study and if, if you had not measured the EMG in this case, you would have said that the right ear, for example, has a lesion, when in fact it doesn't. It's simply because the EMG was uh, less on the right side compared to the uh, left, and this produced a smaller response. So these are the parameters for the, for the CVAMP. If you have a brainstem auditory potential in your laboratory, you can do VAMPs as well, CVAMPs and OVAMPs. Uh, you just have to change the sen sensitivity, the gain if you can, and also have the right stimulus, the tone and the clicks, the intensities like I mentioned initially. You don't have to take this down. If you want, I can send these parameters to you. Find me afterwards and I will give you my card. You can email me. I can email you the slide. I can email you the whole presentation if you like. Um, and I'll be able to help you set up the VAMPs in your laboratory. I have no problem with that. It will be a, I'll be very happy to do so. Now, up to, the, up to 2014, things were, uh, there were different methodologies at the time, using, like I mentioned, air conductive sound, bone conductive vibration, and galvanic stimulation, stimulating the head at various locations. So, we felt at the time, uh, together with my colleagues, Toshi uh, Murafushi from Japan, Faith Akin from the USA, and James Kolbach from the USA, we got together, and in 2014, we published uh, guidelines with regards to how best uh, record and stimulate for cervical vestibular vert modulating potentials that can be agreed upon on a worldwide scale. And now this is considered an international guideline by the International Federation of Clinical Neurophysiology. We hope to do the same for the OVMs as well, and I hope we can do that very soon. So the, the second type of VAMP that I will talk about that is used clinically now, which was discovered later, is the ocular vestibular vert myogenic potential. This time we are recording instead of from the, of from the stenoclidomastoid on the same ear that we are stimulating, we are recording from the opposite inferior oblique muscle, placing an electrode below the opposite eye. And the difference 
with, uh, um, and this differs from the cervical vestibular vertebral marginal potential because this time we are recording utricular function and not sacular function. So recording from the utricle, the superior vestibular nerve this time instead of the vestibular nerve. And, and, and this time we are recording an excitatory response and not an inhibitory one. So two different vamps recording from two, two different parts of the vestibular labyrinth the utricle and the sacral. So the setup again is simple. Uh, this is from the publication of Sally Rosengren, who initiated the, um, the discovery of uh, this potential from the inferior oblique muscle. The setup again is simple, placing an active electrode on the orbital ridge in the middle. We will show this in the workshop later on. The reference electrode is below that in the ground again, either on the forehead or on the sternum. And then this time the patient is asked, to look up, upwards as much as they can. Um, and this, uh, this, this activation is actually easier than the stenoclinomastoid muscle. It's a, so it's a very simple activation procedure. So contraction of what we believe it contributes to the OVM, the inferior oblique muscle contributes to this response. The patient look up, looks up without looking sideways. So they have to look vertically upwards. And this is an example of such a recording in our laboratory where it, instead of being a, a positivity, we have a negativity with the initial peak going upwards. Uh, you don't have to worry about recording EMG this time with the OVAMP. You just ask the patient to look up as much as, as you can, preferably on a mark above them or on the ceiling, depending on your setup. So, with regards to age-related changes, which I'll mention in, um, in this talk today, um, the literature states a trend with regards to VEMPs and regards to age. And what is agreed upon by everyone is that amplitude decreases significantly over the age of 60 years. And this is important if you are going to examine elderly patients. You need to have your own control values. You need to examine your normal physiological population with regards to the elderly age group to determine in your laboratory how it changes. My personal opinion is that you can record VAMPs in elderly people, and I will show you exactly how, to, I will show you examples of this. You just need to know in your laboratory how it changes. Everyone agrees that amplitude drops. With regards to C VAMPs, uh, cervical VAMPs, sorry. Okay, it went forward. With regards to cervical vamps, the latency does not change. So you can record a C vamp in an 85 year old and still get a response at 30 milliseconds. Okay? Um, and amplitude does drop. With regards to the ocular vestibular myogenic potential, um, uh, this is questionable. Some laboratories say the latency changes, some do not. You will see example, I will show you examples now in o of OVAMPs that do not change with age. Um, you can get unobtainable responses, but this is not a rule of thumb. Uh, that, that's, that's why you need to have your own experience in your laboratory with regards to elderly patients. And I will show you some examples here. This is an example of uh, an 84, I don't know why it's showing it like this. Uh, I'll show it bigger. Okay, so um, I'll show the previous slide. So this is a patient I saw the, about uh, three weeks ago, 84 years old. 84 years old, sent to us to rule out bilateral uh, vestibulopathy. Clearly not a bilateral vestibulopathy, especially with regards to the VEMS. Beautiful responses, reproducible responses, both with regards to the CVEMP and the OVEMP response in an 84-year-old. So, at least in our hands, I don't have, my difficulties with elderly patients is very rare, at least up to now with our experience. So, you can record VAMPs in elderly patients, you need the experience uh, to do so. And this is an, another example of a patient who was 74 years old. The EMG is much bigger in this case, but you, when you reproduce the response, you get this reproducible response here on the left. And my marker is not um, good here and this reproducible response here on the right. So you can get vent responses in elderly people as well, which perhaps is more important with regards to vestibular function and dysfunction. It is possible, you just need to get the experience to do so. 
So to summarize with regards to VEMP's methodology, sound stimulation can be used either using tone or clicks, although with tones you can use a lower stimulus intensity, it will be more comfortable for your patient. Uh, 90 decibels for tone or uh, 100 decibels, 110 decibels for clicks, average over 100, 150 stimulations. Um, the CVAMP, secular function from the ipsilateral stenoclidomastoid muscle, and the OVAMP, utricular function from the opposite inferior oblique muscle. Thank you very much.